Hey, I'm Pusher, and recently I posted a question on Instagram asking what kind of videos you guys would like to see, and I got a lot of responses that said a video about mixing, so that's what we're going to do today. I'm going to be going through my song Sober with Soren Bryce as an example, uh, and I'm going to use that to show a lot of the tricks that I use in pretty much every song all the time to make sure that my mixes are clean and neat and, and just tidy and that everything has its place. So that's what we're doing today. Before I go into any of this, I don't want to waste anybody's time, so I've put a list of like the plugins with a brief description of the trick in the description below, so uh, you can just take a quick look at that, and if all of this is just stuff that you already know, then, you know, go watch a cat video or something. Hey, I'm jumping in here to say that a lot of these tricks are subtle. When I watched this final edited video, um, it was difficult to tell the overall impact that the plugins are going to have. So what I did is I went through the entire session and I turned off every plugin that I'm going to be talking about in this video. So you can hear what the track sounds like with all these tricks and without all of them. Here's what it sounds like with them. Here's what it sounds like without them. Here's what it sounds like again with. Anyway. And here's what it sounds like without. Anyway. So as you could tell, uh, these plugins make a huge difference. Now most of them are going to be subtle, but when you use them all together, it's going to make a big difference. The track's going to be punchier, it's going to be cleaner, the low end's going to be tidier, and your focus is going to be more clearly directed at what you should be hearing in the song. First things first. I was thinking about how I approach mixing, and I actually did uh, like a workshop at Humber College about this last year. Um, and just the way that I approach mixing a song, I like to look at a, like any song as though it's an ecosystem. So what that means is that every sound has its own very specific place. But also there's like a food chain for the sounds. You can think of it like a painting where you have the foreground, the midground, and the background. You sort of have three layers of importance. You've got your main thing. You've got the second most important thing that supports it, and then everything after that which sort of fills out the song and polishes it off. In this song, and in a lot of vocal music, I've found that the most important thing is clearly the vocals. Uh, in a song that doesn't have vocals, it might be a lead. I think that the second most important sound, at least in music like this, sort of electronic, um, not necessarily dance music, but music that's got like a strong beat, the second most important sound is often the kick and snare combination to get that beat across. So definitely the most important thing is the vocal, the second most important thing is the kick and snare, and the third most important thing is pretty much everything else. So that would be your effects, your leads, your chords, your basses, and the rest of your drums. Speaking of which, when you're thinking of what a song really is and how it functions, I like to think of six categories of sounds. You've got vocals, effects, leads, chords, basses, and drums. And then there's sort of four macro global parameters that determine what the song is going to be like. And those are your tempo, the speed of the song, the length of the song, think of any two minute song versus any seven minute song, for example, and what you have to do to keep the song interesting over that period of time. And then the time signature is going to contribute to the groove of the song, though most of the time people are just using 4-4 anyway. And then the key signature will be important to individual instruments in different ways. For example, you'll find a disproportionate amount of trap and dubstep songs uh, will be in the key of F minor because F is like the lowest really powerful note that you can get from a sub before the range of it starts to make it quieter. Or if you're writing for actual instruments, you'll find that some parts are more difficult on some instruments uh, because of the key. For example, uh, like a clarinet will have an octave key, or like some keys on the piano can be more difficult, or things like that. So anyway, the key can be really important to the arrangement of your song. Anyway, with all that stuff in mind, let's get into some of the more technical tricks that I use for mixing a song. To make this easier to think about, I've divided all the tricks into four different like dimensions. We have our dynamics, which is the loud and soft, the levels. We have EQ, which is sort of like our vertical axis. We have panning, which is our left-right axis, and we have reverb, which is like the depth, uh, near and far. So a lot of time in mixing, people will conceive of like uh, the sound stage, which is like imagine a 3D stage in your speakers or headphones, and some stuff will come from the right, and some stuff will come from the left, some stuff will be farther away, uh, and then some stuff will be higher or lower. And that's kind of how we're going to conceive of uh, a lot of these tricks moving sounds around, so that everything has its own specific place, on that stage. All right, first let's talk about some of the tricks that I use for dynamics. Obviously the first thing you're gonna talk about when you're getting your dynamics right is the level. How loud or how quiet are you going to make each sound? 
To decide that, you're going to think about your focus. You want to make sure that your vocal is always going to be coming through and it's not going to be covered by anything else. And definitely a lot of like bedroom producer type people are known to make the track too loud and the vocals too quiet because they work on the track and they want the track to shine. But you have to remember that when you're producing vocal music, you want the vocal to come through. Just like if you were producing instrumental music, you would want to make sure that people heard your leads so that they would be able to catch the melody more than something that's supposed to be supporting that. Once you have your levels, the next one's compression. This is sort of obvious. I don't want to go into this too much, but compression basically just takes a dynamic range, which is the loudest sounds and the quietest sounds, and sort of squashes it. So the louds are less loud and the quiets are less quiet. And you can turn that up too. So something like a vocal, for example, you would compress it um, so that the quietest bits of the vocal don't get buried and the loudest bits don't pop out too much. You can also sidechain compress, which I know is like a meme, like people talk about it so much, um, but it's super useful when trying to make sure that your focus is being heard. So you could, for example, send the vocal to a compressor on the chords or whatever to sort of squash the chords a little bit when the vocal's happening, so the vocal comes through. Uh, and a lot of people obviously use this to send the kick to everything in their mix so that the mix kind of pulses and gets out of the way a little bit so the kick comes through and you can feel the beat better. So compression and sidechain compression is a good trick, but there are a few other things you can do that are similar to it that aren't quite as destructive because when you compress a sound, you are losing some of the quality, especially of the higher frequency sounds. One dynamic trick you can use to get supporting elements out of the way is the LFO tool. This is made by X for Records. I don't think this one's free. It might be like 20 or $40. But what this is basically going to do is automate the volume of your track to follow this line. The presets that I like to use are sidechain one, two, and three, but obviously there's lots and lots of different ones to play with. Uh, this can be really useful in four on the floor stuff like house music, uh, and I also use it a lot at higher BPMs to get things like chords to have a pulsing effect. Uh, so you can hear that here on the chord sound. We'll solo this. And here's what it sounds like without. The one big limitation to the LFO tool is you're pretty much stuck with whatever you draw in this space. In Ableton, I believe there's a way to have this plugin trigger uh, when a kick or something happens, so it would act like a sidechain compressor on things that don't just have a four on the floor kick. It can also be useful, I found, in the like 140 BPM to like 160, 170 BPM range, um, just to create sort of a pulsing feeling. I really like LFO tool because what it's doing is automating the volume instead of compressing the sound, uh, so you're not losing any quality, it's just getting a little quieter. Another plugin that I use a lot, and this is one of the most powerful plugins that I'm aware of, it's uh, super versatile. This is the Waze Factory Track Spacer. What this is, is it sort of acts like a multi-band sidechain compressor. So what I'm doing here is I'm sending my main vocal out to bus 21, and I've got that coming into the track spacer, which I've put on my chords bus. It's like a 32 band EQ. And what it's going to do is when the vocal's happening, it's going to push down the level uh, of the chord in the frequency range that the vocal takes up. And you can see what that looks like here. You can change the amount here. Uh, and you can change the low and high range that it's affecting. This is one of the most powerful plugins that I use to make sure everything has its space in the mix. So I send the vocal to this and I put it on my leads and on my chords because those are the sounds that are in the same frequency range as the vocals. And so I want to get them out of the way and make sure that the vocal isn't being masked or covered up by them. And then I will also send the kick to a separate one and put that on my bass so that when the kick happens, it pushes the bass out of the way because again, it's in the same frequency range. Another good trick that I use is New York or parallel compression. And I use a free plugin for this. It's called the Audio Damage Rough Rider. I've been using this for like six years on my drums specifically. And I just use their uh, NY compression preset. So what I'm doing here is I'm sending all my drums to a bus and then I'm sending that bus to an aux channel uh, with the Rough Rider on it for some parallel compression. And what basically this means is you've got your drums all coming out, you hear your drums uncompressed, so you have the full dynamic range of them, and then you're sending them out through another channel where they're hitting this compressor and they're being squashed and made louder. I'll play my drums without it and then I'll turn it on. Here it is with it. You can hear it makes them a little punchier, uh, a little bit louder, and that's basically what's happening is you're combining an uncompressed signal with a compressed signal so that you're getting a little bit of both worlds, but not too much of one or the other. 
Another great trick that I like to use for dynamics is the transient designer. I use native instruments one because I have the complete box set, but like logic has a stock one. I'm sure any, any reputable DAW will have a stock one. And what this is going to do is it's going to help you control the dynamic contour of your sound. Uh, it's going to let you add or take away attack and sustain on a sound. So I'll show you what that sounds like on my toms here. Like, let's turn the attack way up so you're getting more punch and the sustain way down so it, it ends quickly. This is what it sounds like with it, uh, with it. So Transient Designer can be really useful on things like drums to make sure they punch through your mix uh, better. You can use it on plucky melodies as well. Here we've got an arpeggiated melody uh, and we've got Transient Designer. I'll play it without and then I'll turn it on. And you can hear it just makes it like a lot pluckier uh, and almost a lot brighter because you get more of a click at the beginning of the note. So those are some of the dynamics tricks that I use. That's your levels, that's your loud and soft, and making sure that everything has a place for itself in the mix, often by pushing something else out of the way temporarily. Next, let's talk about some frequency tricks. Quick crash course on frequency tricks. Here's an EQ. Uh, I'll just play the song and I'll change the EQ so you can see what happens. Right, so frequency is like the high and low, not just notes, but also sounds. You can hear any things like S's and T's, sibilant things, those are your high frequency sounds. And then like a truck rolling by outside your house, that rumble, that's a low frequency sound. And so here are some tricks that I use to control the frequency of different sounds in the song and make them more impactful and make them fit together better. So obviously the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is EQ. Uh, I don't wanna to go too much into EQ because this is a simple trick. But basically, the, the main thing that you're using EQ for is making sure that your low end isn't all messed up. Things like the kick and the bass are the things that are going to be dominating your low end. One amazing plugin that I know a lot of Ableton users are familiar with is the OTT, which I believe actually stands for Over the Top. This is a reverse compressor, so what it does is instead of squashing the high frequency sounds, it pulls them up. Uh, I'll solo the vocals and I'll just uh, turn it on and off so you can hear what it sounds like. Here it is without. I have to take it over, it's only my mistake Already feeling sober, anyway, anyway So you can hear when I turn it on, the vocals get a little bit brighter and when I turn it up, uh, it starts to have a negative effect of pulling up things like room noise and breath uh, to a distracting amount. But this can be a tremendously useful plug-in to make things brighter, pads and vocals anything where you want like a crispy, bright, high-end sound. And frankly, I pretty much use this on almost everything in a mix. So those are two good technical tricks for frequency stuff in a mix, but a lot of the tricks that I use are like arrangement things to help uh, different sections stand out in a frequency way. The first one is the use of noise or a cymbal crash or whatever to uh, indicate section changes. I'll show you what I mean by that. Up here I have white noise. Here it is in the context of the song. Already feeling sober. Anyway, anyway. Here's another common trick that I use in my own specific way. At section changes, I like to use one specific symbol I found. Uh, it sounds like this. Just, it's like, it's almost like a drummer hitting a crash at the start of a section. Uh, here's what it sounds like uh, at the start of the drop. Right, now here it is without that sound, you're gonna hear a big difference. Right, so you can see that this, this like little cymbal crash really does a lot to open up the frequency range of this section, which sort of indicates in a frequency way that this is a big section. I think uh, at the second half of the drop, it happens twice in a row. Right, now here it is without that. So that's a trick that makes a huge, huge, huge difference. Uh, and there are lots and lots of variations on this. Some people use long white noise, like a kss. Uh, some people, I mean, obviously drummers are hitting a crash. Uh, I like to use a really tight sound because my music is percussive and there's lots of stuff going on so I don't have lots of open space uh, for a sound to just be lingering. If you listen to Flume's music, he uses like the super high like kss sound. <laughs> 
And so it can be really, really valuable to use different areas of your frequency range to do different things in your song. Another frequency trick that's more of an arranging trick is up here in the vocal. So we've got our main vocal here. I have to take it over. And I've just doubled this track here and put on the Waves uh, Sound Shifter Pitch Plugin at 12 semitones, and we've got an octave double. It's only my and I turned down the level a whole lot. You can see the level of this one is at zero. The level of this one is like negative 15. And what this does, you can hear coming out of this section. Never was my own luxury. It's just going to make the vocal sound bigger and fuller. Like you barely notice it. Again, this is a super common trick. I see people talking about this all the time. I'm probably just completely wasting all your time with this video. Two more good EQ tricks at the start of a drop. I didn't do it in this song, um, but at the start of a drop, just having like a big chord, especially with high notes and low notes, um, just whatever chord is happening at the start of a big section, uh, making sure that chord happens on beat one, even if it just happens quickly, uh, really does a lot to increase the intensity of a big section. And then obviously another frequency related thing is your key choice, and we talked about why, because it affects different instruments and their ranges differently. Okay, next on to tricks that affect the left-right axis of your song. So obviously the first one is panning. Do you want to have things in the middle, which means that the level of the sound is coming equally from the left and right speakers, or do you want to change that so it sounds like it's coming from either the left or the right side of your mix? Again, thinking about focus, usually you want to have the important things like the kick and the snare and the vocals in the center of your mix. Of course, you don't have to. And then you can do other things with the panning of other sounds. One thing that actual bands do is if you've got a keyboard and a guitar, they'll put the guitar on one side and the keyboard on the other side. That way they're kind of balanced. And a lot of people definitely think about balancing. So if you move something far to the left, you want to make sure that you're balancing it and moving something far to the right. You obviously don't have to do this, but it's worth considering because when you start to mess with left-right stuff, it is going to be very noticeable. I don't mess a whole lot with panning, but if you want to dig more into this and try to come up with some neat ideas about what you can do with panning, definitely listen to both The Beatles and Radiohead. Those are two bands that use really bizarre creative panning, so you could probably learn something from those two bands. I did a breakdown of the Muramasa song One Night with Charlie XCX, and there's a bit where he has uh, one hi-hat on each side, and it just kind of makes the mix sound a little wider and more interesting and playful. Once you've decided where every sound is going to go on the left-right axis, you can start to mess with it in more creative ways. Another way to get things out of the middle of your mix is to automate the panning. So what we're going to do is let's go back to this arpeggiating lead here, this guy. And let's open up Logic's tremolo effector. You could use some auto pan depending on what your DAW is. And there's a few different parameters you can play with, but basically this is going to move the sound from left to right. You can control how far left to right from center, uh, you control how quickly, you can control how sudden it jumps from left to right. So here's what that sounds like without first, and then I'll turn it on. I personally like to use this on things that move quickly, like hi-hats or arpeggios. And mostly what it's for is clearing up space in the middle of your mix, but I also think it makes your song a little more playful and fun sounding. Another great left-right trick is the Haas effect, which is when you delay uh, either the left or right speaker by between, I think, 8 and 32 milliseconds. And instead of sounding like a normal delay where one happens before the other one, your brain perceives the sound as just being wider. So I use Logic's sample delay for that, and I usually use 513 samples. There's no reason for that at all. You could use any amount of samples. But I like to use 513. So I'll solo the chord without, and then I'll turn it on so you can hear what happens. So you can hear when I turned it on, uh, the sound changed. That was it getting wider. It may not necessarily be easy to tell that it's gotten wider, just that it's changed. So what I'll do is I'll solo it with the vocal, with just the lead vocal, and I'll turn it on and off so you can hear how it clashes first with the vocal, and then when I turn it on, how it kind of gets out of the way of the vocal and feels wider. So here it is without. I have to take it over. It's only my mistake. Already feeling sober. And that is the Haas effect. The one thing that people don't really like about this effect is that it works only in stereo. So if you sum your mix to mono, then the left and right of your chord will be out of phase and will cancel with each other and will create all kinds of unwanted effects, like making your chord sound like it's disappeared. 
A left-right related trick that I like to use on my bass is chorus. You can use this on anything, but I find that if you use it on things that have higher frequency, it changes the tonal character. So I tend to reserve the use of chorus for widening my bass sounds. I'll play it on my sub first without, and then I'll turn it on so you can hear what it sounds like. And for this, I'm just using Logic's stock chorus effect with the mega wide chorus preset. Normally I would not use this on my sub. I would have my sub in the center of the mix. And then what I would have is a top layer of bass with the lows cut off and chorus on that. So you kind of get the best of both worlds with the sub right up the middle. And then you still have a wide uh, sort of low mid range bass above it. One more left right related plugin that I really like is the Dimension Expander from X for Records. This is, I believe, a recreation of the Dimension Expander in uh, Native Instruments Massive Synth that comes as a built in effect. This is going to make your sounds wider as well. I usually like to keep the dry weight at 50 and the size at zero. I'll play it on a soloed vocal without first, and then I'll turn it on so you can hear how the sound changes. And then I'm going to play with the size knob, and you can see how you can use this as sort of like a slapback delay effect. I have to take it over. It's only my mistake. I have to take it over. It's only my mistake. I have to take it over. It's only my mistake. I have to take it over. It's only my mistake. So as you can see, very simple plugin, on off, dry wet, size, but you can really do a ton with it to change the sound, either making it sound narrow, wide, or as a kind of simple small reverb or delay effect. I use the Dimension Expander pretty much on everything in Massive, and I occasionally use the standalone VST on other things as well. And for the last bit, let's talk briefly about sort of reverb and front to back. So I'm not going to bother explaining reverb. You turn on reverb, it sounds like you're in a church or whatever. You turn off reverb and it sounds super dry. Uh, not going to worry about that. That dimension expander trick that I showed you is another thing that's similar to reverb, but first off, takes less CPU if that's a concern of yours. Uh, and also, I find it's a lot tighter because it's like one quick echo. Expanding on that, I know a lot of people um, prefer delay to reverb because it gives you the effect of it sort of echoing but it doesn't fill up the space as much. Reverb does seriously, seriously take up space in your mix, but I have a couple cool tricks that I use to um, make it take up less space in the mix. So here we've got our vocal bus. All of our vocals are being sent through. It sounds like this. I have to take it over. That's awesome. Don't forget to go check out Soren Bryce's music. She's incredible. So I have the reverb really quiet here. I'm gonna turn it up so we can hear it better just for the sake of this example. I have to take it over. Okay, so the reverb's taking up a lot of space, and I've got four plugins here that are going to try to mitigate that in some way. The first one is an EQ. I'm cutting off everything below 500 hertz on my reverb just to make sure that it's not clashing with things in the low end, because that's not what I need. When you turn this on, here's what the reverb sounds like. I have to take it. Really no noticeable difference. You still get all of the good reverby stuff that you want. If you were to turn it up higher, you'd probably start to lose a little bit of it and it would sound like it's cut. I have to take it over. It's only my right, so you still get a lot of that good reverby stuff that you like. The next effect that I use on my reverb chain is a direction mixer. And this is a similar thing to the Haas effect of the dimension expander or chorus, where what it's gonna be doing is moving the sound from the middle of the mix the outside. So I've turned up the reverb here so you can hear what it sounds like. I'll start super narrow and then I'll drag it to be wider. I have to take it over. It's only my mistake. I have to take it over. It's only my mistake. So you can hear as I drag it up to the sides, the reverb apparently gets wider and moves out to the sides of the mix rather than being in the center. And this is just one of the effects plugins that I use to get reverb out of the way of the vocal so that you can still have a lot of reverb in your mix, but you can get it out of the way of things so it's not masking them. And then I've got two compressors on it. So the first one is coming from bus one, which is my kick side chain. So anytime the kick happens, it's pushing the reverb down with a compressor. And the second one is bus three. So anything being sent to the reverb, while the sound is happening, the reverb is being pressed down. And when the sound stops happening, it comes back up. And that has the effect of not masking the sound that's going to the reverb. I'll show you what that sounds like with and without. Here it is without first, and when I turn it on, hopefully we'll hear the vocal uh, a little bit better. I have to take it over. It's only my mistake. 
Yeah, so uh, that's subtle, but I can definitely, definitely hear it happening. When the vocal's happening, uh, it's going to the reverb, and the reverb is, you know, filling up the space, but this compressor is also pushing it down to get it out of the way of the vocal. And then when the vocal stops happening, the reverb sort of fills up that space again, uh, which is a really nice trick to have reverb on your vocal, but not crowd your vocal with that very same reverb. Obviously, instead of this compressor, you could also use something like the track spacer, which is really nice. Oh, and then I actually didn't do it on this particular track, but one thing I also like to do on my reverb especially is add the OTT. It pulls out the reverb a little bit. I'll show you what that sounds like. I'll just turn this up. I have to take it over. It's only my mistake. That can be a really good trick to make your reverb sound a little bit brighter and airier. Uh, I really like that. Really what I'm using reverb for here is just a little bit of ambience to make it sound more natural. And then often I'll use reverb just to make a sound sort of stand out more. All right, that's pretty much all these simple little tricks that I use. Um, they can be used super effectively to clean up a mix. I know if you're even a halfway experienced producer, you probably know all these tricks from YouTube tutorials like this one. Uh, but it took me a really long time to collect all of them when I was learning to produce. So I just wanted to put them all into one video. And I wanted to wrap up with a couple big macro tricks. First off, remember those, those groups from the start, the vocals, the leads, uh, effects, chords, basses, and drums, the six different sounds. Uh, you probably noticed this already, but like all of my vocals are up here and they're all running through a vocal uh, bus. All my effects are here. All of my leads, there's so many leads. All of my leads are running through this. All of my chords are running through this. Bass and all my drums here. And what this allows me to do, why I think this is so important, is it allows you to hear what's going on in the track. So let's say for a second that while I'm making this track, I find the chorus not quite hitting hard enough. It's boring me for whatever reason. It feels too slow. So I'm going to listen to it. I have to take it over. Well, if I've got all the vocals going out through this, I can quickly mute the vocals. And it allows me to more quickly troubleshoot different sections. Or if I think the drums are fine, I can listen to what's going on in the rest of the track. Just by setting up these groups, it allows you to more quickly troubleshoot what's going on in the track. You can solo your vocals. Already feeling sober. Uh, which allows you to locate any little problems. Um, Maybe there's like a click sound or whatever. If you've got some sound that's happening that's not supposed to, or if something's not working the way it is supposed to, just having them set up in groups allows you to quickly listen to larger sections of the song and sort of figure out what's going on and troubleshoot more quickly. Uh, I don't usually do this until I'm about three quarters of the way through like finishing the song. Um, because you know, when you're making a song, it's a messy process and you're trying like, oh, does this sound work? No. Does this sound work? No. Oh, does this sound work? Yes. Uh, and you end up with a lot of random tracks that you don't need. So when I'm getting close to finishing a song, I delete all the tracks that aren't doing anything, and I take all the ones that are doing stuff, and I put them into these group buses, and it just allows me to more quickly make sense of the song and fix things uh, and finish up the song. Yeah. All right. Hopefully this look inside sober was of any use to anybody. Um, I know a lot of these tricks are simple, but I find them all to be super effective when used together uh, in tidying up a track, finishing it up, making it sound nice, making sure everything has its own place, making sure that the vocal has the focus and that the kick is supporting it and that everything else is not messing with the order of my ecosystem. Uh, if you have any questions that I didn't address or things that I went over too quickly or whatever, uh, just leave a comment and I could probably respond to individual things in text. Or if I miss too many things, I can make another video or whatever. Don't forget to go check out Soren Bryce. Don't forget to go listen to Sober on Spotify. Um, and give me like a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a penny in royalties for that. If you have other ideas for videos that are like this, maybe, that I could maybe address or do something useful to talk about, uh, let me know and I will consider that. Anyway, hope you enjoyed. I'm Pusher. Have a good one. Careless with my brain.